If you will be turning your New Test to your New Testaments and to the book of Acts, chapter 5, and in a moment we'll read verses 1 through 10. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. We're glad that all of you are here. We welcome our visitors. And I, I haven't said this much in recent uh, months, but we're happy to have those who may be coming over the Internet. And we trust that this is a service to you to help you wherever you are. And there's no church there for you to assemble with. And thus you can be where you are and following along with our worship, worship God there. And we pray that people throughout the world will have the opportunity to be certainly with a group of Christians somewhere that will be faithful to the divine volume, to the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Anybody here that has any questions of religious or Bible nature, we welcome those questions and we'll do you our best to give a Bible answer to them. And that's what we live for. Our faith is in Christ and faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. With that being said, I would like for us to read this passage of Scripture, Acts 5, 1 through 10. But a certain man named Ananias, with the fire of his wife, sold possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much? And she said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which I buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her, dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Have you ever had people, when you tried to work with them, to study the Bible with them, or even members of the church who were derelict in their duty, make as an excuse by saying, I don't want to have anything to do with that church over there, down there, somewhere. <laughs> there are just too many hypocrites there. Well, over the nearly 50 years, I've tried to preach the gospel and be true to God through faithful obedience in my life and teaching in defense of the truth. I couldn't tell you how many times I've, I've heard that, even from certain family members. It seems to me in the study of the Bible, especially the life of our Lord and His earthly ministry, that anyone would pick up rather quickly how much God is opposed to hypocrisy. And you know, when you look at the situation with Ananias and Sapphira, that's the first sin in the church. It involved lying, but actually, back behind that, was hypocrisy. They wanted to appear to be something they really were not. Now, it's true, in religion, then we see that hypocrisy is a major problem. To say that it's not is really to deny what the Bible has said from the Jews all the way up through the end of the Bible regarding people. Uh, we like to lie to ourselves, and that's really what it is when we're hypocrites. We have lied to ourselves, and we think we're lying to God. I do not know why we think we can hide what we are from God. In our innermost thoughts and purposes and motives, God knows them just as well as you do. Our word, hypocrite, 
comes from a Greek word that sounds a whole lot like hypocrite, hypocrites. And in the Greek language, it meant an actor under an assumed character, a stage player. Today, we would simply say they're just putting on an act. Well, that may be all right when you're engaged in theater and the part you're playing doesn't involve you acting out sin. Everybody knows these people are not what they're acting out. But it's a different story in the Lord's church, and it's obvious from Acts 5, which didn't just take up space, that God wants us to be sure about our purposes and motives and what we really are. Christianity begins in the heart. And if you don't have an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15. If you're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness from the heart, if whatever you do in word or in deed, in service to God as the Bible teaches, is not because you want to please Him, you want to do what's right as the Bible defines the right, if for any other motive, you better rethink the motive. People put on an act for a variety of reasons, and yet they do. Some people pretend to be what they are not simply because they're polite. They're polite hypocrites. The aunt who says of her nieces and nephews, oh, aren't they cute? But in the heart, she's thinking, why can't they keep those hoodlums under control? The miser who at a meal says to everybody, glad you're here to eat up. There's more in the kitchen where that came from. That's not enough. We'll go to the store and buy some more. But wishes you would really just finish with one small plateful. Writer Proverb, Proverbs 28, verses 6 through 8, said this. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Didn't know that fit that context, did you? For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shall thou vomit up and lose thy sweet word. Unfortunately, people do this to God as well as other men. We ask God for great blessings. We regularly do this. But do we really have faith that He will bless us as we live in harmony with His will? In James 1, 6 through 8, He dealt with Christians in the first century. He had a problem with that. But let Him ask in faith. Well, remember, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. You're asking on the basis of what the Bible teaches is so. Nothing wavering, no doubts whatsoever. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And then he sums it up. And I would say that describes Ananias and Sapphira of Acts chapter 5. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Again, James 1, 6 through 8. Sometimes it happens because you pray because someone asks you to do so, but your heart really isn't in it. Or you pray because it's the proper thing to do, but it's not what you desire. And you may even say, we'll remember you in our prayers, but at the end of the week, you haven't even thought to pray for the person or about whatever it was that was being said. Or the announcements are made and somebody's ill, somebody's this, somebody's got a problem. And we'll say, and let's remember them in my prayers. God condemned the Israelites for just simply lip worship. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and their lips do honor me. But I have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. Isaiah 29, 13. Now the Lord quoted that concerning the religious Pharisees, Sadducees, and doctors of the law in his life on earth. You know what he's actually saying? 
He says, their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. It's just what they've always done, and they can just repeat it without any thought, and their heart's not really in it. And I think we can ask the question to make our mind be as sharp as possible. Is this, is this not what happens to many people? You just do something over and over and over and over again for years, and it becomes a habit without meaning. Now, that doesn't mean we should not do what's right when it's required required of us as what his right is uh, whenever there's time to do it and that'll involve doing it years and years and years but do we really think in our minds why we're doing it maybe we could say even worse you carry on what you have been taught by parents or others without understanding significance you don't know why so many young people when they reach their 20s just leave the church they never were in it well when they were baptized and they were 12 or 15 why? Was it because they really from the heart understood their lost condition and that Jesus is the only Savior and they had to obey His gospel, His power to save, to be saved? They wanted to serve Him with all their heart? Or just because that's what people do and other people about that age are doing it and, you know, kids don't want to be left out. They want to be thought of. Maybe they want to get somebody off their back. So they do it too, but they don't learn. They go to church in the back seat of the car with mom and daddy and they give all the right answers and they don't cause any problems at home and, and they're sweet, nice children, etc., etc., except they never believe the truth really on their own. And it told on them when they got away. That happens over and over again. It has for years and years. If I look back at my own time as a teenager at the people that were within two or three years of my age I don't know to this day how many of them have been faithful to the Lord as the Bible describes faithfulness. And things weren't nearly as bad then far as worldliness being around as it is today. A person must personally seek the truth in the Lord for the right reason. Or at some point they will fall away. There is that person, a hypocrite, playing his act, who purposely deceives. Now this is the one that we usually think of as being in the wrong, the most uh, used as an example of what we think of as a hypocrite, a malicious man who, who covers up his intentions. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart, whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Proverbs 26, 24 through 26. Now you know those scribes and Pharisees that the Lord said hypocrites. They knew this was in the Old Testament. You think they'd personally and honestly, sincerely applied that to their lives? Well to see it further, let's look at some examples from the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 22, 15 through 22, you have the Jews who should have been more than ever ready to receive, or first of all, identify and receive the Lord. But here we find them in Matthew 22, beginning verse 15, attempting to entrap Jesus. Notice what the Scripture says. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Well, they're not meeting to say, let's... Learn the truth from this man. We realize all these things about him. And if you read all Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they recognize he worked miracles. But they wouldn't realize that came from God. They tried to say, well, yes, he works a miracle. It comes with the power of Satan. Of course, Jesus straightened it out on that. And they went out, and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true. That's the biggest lie that they could ever told. We know thou art true, and teach us the way of God in truth. They did not. Neither carest thou for any man. Well, as far as it changing the way the Lord lived and acted, that's true. And they, they find it out. For thou regardest not the person of men. They got that right. But they didn't make an application to themselves, and they knew they were trying to entangle him. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? And I won't go into all of this because you now know the motive and that's what we're looking at. These folks say we are God's blue ribbon servants. They weren't. They were hypocrites. 
When you look at those closest to the Lord, the ones He chose, Judas supposedly, that is Judas Iscariot, supposedly cared for helping the poor who could not help themselves. Well, listen what's recorded in John. John 12, verses 4 through 6, about Judas Iscariot. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Well, here again, God's people are not shielded from such people as that. We're just told how to deal with them as far as them hindering our spiritual service. In Romans 16, 17, and 18, Paul warned the church at Rome and seeing that that's part of the New Testament, he warns everybody that they're going to be false teachers and that they are false teachers because they want to profit from their work. Paul says as he closes that letter, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, who do they serve? Their own belly. That means their own fleshly desires that they seek to gratify. And by good words and fair speeches, Deceive the hearts of the simple. Again, Romans 16, 17, through 18. They're hypocrites. They're playing a part. They look like they're serving God, but when you take a closer look, they're serving themselves. Now, some hypocrites do it for the quote unquote fun of stirring up a fuss. Notice what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, 15 through 18. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. And some also of goodwill, the right motive. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing that affliction to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now, I don't get the wrong idea. He's saying if they preach the pure gospel of Christ because they try to bring me trouble, then at least they're still preaching the gospel and the truth regarding salvation is set out. But what about them personally? Their motive was wrong. They played a part. That wasn't really what they were doing this for. I suppose saddest of all are those whose act deceives them. I think the Jews once again illustrate this point. They simply claim to live righteously. We're keeping His commandments. We love Him with our whole heart. But they're not. In Matthew 23, 2 and 3, Then spake Jesus to the multitude, and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But he didn't end there. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, when he's got the Bible open, and he's reading to you what the inspired word of the living God says, you can trust Him. But not when it comes to what He teaches you ought to do and what that means in your life. And why? Well, they say and do not. I'm not saying they, in all cases, or at least at the beginning of their efforts, that they purposely set out to deceive people. I don't doubt that some did. It's obvious from the Scriptures some did. But in their misguiding intentions... It ended up there. That's why we've got to always be testing ourselves and say, am I honest with the truth and its application to me and why I'm doing what I'm doing, the motive behind my doing what I'm doing? 
they said they were giving glory to God, but were they by their actions? For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. And lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And love the uppermost rooms of, at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, Matthew 23, 4 through 7. He identifies in that generation, in that culture, according to the law and the traditions of those people, those things they love because they love the praise of men. Jesus in another place would say, they have their reward. If that's what they wanted, they've got it. Which is pretty much saying, but they don't have the eternal reward. They said they were saving the lost. But they caused people to lose their souls. Because they taught them falsely. Listen to this. But woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. Watch what they really make out of him. And when he's made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Now that's what false teacher does. Even those who say we're the grandest servants of God never walk this earth, they pretend to be what they're not. Matthew 23, 13 and 15. Now they declared that they were close adherents to the law. That they were following the law. But the truth of the matter is they obscured the law. They made it harder or more difficult to follow. In Matthew 23, 16 and 17, notice how they over-regulated, if you'll be nice about it. They bound where God had not bound. And Jesus says, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, why, it's nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he's a debtor. Ye fools and blind. For whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. Now that was according to their traditions. If they swore by the temple, they would perform what they said they would do. They didn't feel compelled to do it. But, you know, gold, I want to tell you something about where they, their thought of what was expensive. If they swore by the gold of the temple, then that meant they had to perform it. Look in Matthew 15, 1 through 11. And you'll see where the Lord really nails, we would say, where I came from, their hide to the wall. In Matthew 15, beginning in verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which are of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It's a gift, but whatsoever thou mightest be profited by it, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah the prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. That's the scripture we read a while ago from Isaiah. And honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's a sad, sad situation to say the least. They're willing to overlook major points to enforce what is really minor points. Now, they're not minor in their own mind. You ever heard majoring in minors? We even use that to this day. 
But to them, that is the chief thing. I've seen people on a number of occasions on different matters over the years I've preached, they'll zero in on one thing. If we had that straight in the church, the whole church would be what God wanted it to be. But there could be other things, contrary to the will of heaven being done by members. And you've seen the horse with his blinders on. They could see only that microphone. Well, if I'm like this, I'd like no one else I can see. But they do. we do it to ourselves. We make that the thing that's most important. Paul preached the whole counsel of God because it was needful people know all of the will of God. We should not preach any less than he did. Neither should we seek that people be obedient to any less than he did. And what is taught as the whole counsel of God is what people need to be obedient to. Now, I'm not saying if you've got a certain problem rising at a certain time, you have to deal with it. But still, some people, you know, this one thing becomes the thing. And they don't get upset over anybody else. And I've seen it happen too often. They're willing to overlook these major points to enforce the minor ones. Now listen to this. Woe unto you, Jesus says, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Now I know there's weightier matters of the law. Jesus said it. And I don't accept, make anybody accept it. And if he said it, I ought to be able to find it in his word. And here, and it's saying today, justice, uh, mercy, and faith, Notice, these ought ye to have done. He didn't finish there. And not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, it's straining a gnat and swallow a camel. Matthew 23, 23 through 24. Now, you know, it might be that I can point out one person or a group of people that are engaged in sin and prove it. Well, if they're what they ought to be, Regardless of what I am, they'll repent of it because it's God's will they've broken. But it's terrible when I can deal with that sin, whatever it might be. But then on other sins, I give it a pass. Let me ask you that. Is that hypocrisy? If it's not, what, would, what, what could we call it? I don't know what else to call it. You blind guys, you strain in the net, swallow a camel. Now you know how to strain in the net and swallow a camel. At least you learned that much. In their zeal for the Sabbath, they overlooked that God had performed a miracle in their midst. Notice how narrow they got. In Luke 13, 10 through 17, And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Now think of that. 18 years she's been in this misery. And what was it? Well, she was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. She Just that way. She was frozen in that way with her infirmity. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, look how simple it was for Jesus. Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. He laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler, now this, notice this ruler of the synagogue. A ruler of the synagogue. <laughs> The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. And I'm sure he considered himself as godly as it's possible to be godly. If you're in misery, then it can only take place Monday through Friday <laughs> or Sunday through Friday. It can only take place then. You just have to stay in misery if it starts on the Sabbath. Who cares? Miss the whole point about all of it. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Well, that involved how people got money. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. Well, they ought to have been. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Luke 13, 10 through 17. Do you think if people got that way then, these very religious people, that it's possible for members of the church to get that way today? They claim to be righteous worshipers of God. But they lived 
unrighteous, therefore unholy lives. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are likened to whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Matthew 23, beginning verse 27. They emphasized the physical and they neglected the spiritual. Again, Jesus in Matthew 23, 29 through 31. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which kill the prophets. Can't get the one who sent the message, but you can get the messenger. And still call yourself very faithful, and the church ought to be full of folks like you. But lest we get too busy condemning the Jews, we must remember, I say again, that Christians have been guilty of the same thing. Listen to what Paul said to Timothy about a great apostasy, a falling away from the doctrine of Christ. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. Give us the process, Paul, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons or devils. Watch it. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Some of the doctrines for that time, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Perhaps the greatest self-deception is the one who sees only his own righteousness. And the Lord had something to say about that. Judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam that's in thine own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that's in thine own eye. We probably say today, don't you have a mirror? Thy hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the moat that is in thy brother's eye. Luke 6, 37 through 42. It's so easy to forgive our own faults while condemning the faults of others. You better think about that. Let me give you at least an example we all know that we should, if we know our Bible at all, attend the worship gatherings of the church on the Lord's Day. And then somebody says, oh, you're, when you say that, they say, oh, well, well you're, you're thinking of Sister Maybell. She comes when she feels like it. She just does it when it's convenient to her. Meanwhile, you come to every single solitary worship assembly and Bible study. But when you're there, you sing, but you're thinking about something else other than the words of the song. You bow your head in prayer, but you're going over what's really concerning you, what's going to happen tomorrow or this afternoon. You partake of the Lord's Supper, but... While you're doing it, your mind's wondering if you'll be able to pay all your bills next week or some project the boss has assigned you that you don't have ready yet and expect it done by in the morning. Now let me ask you, who's the greater actor 
Sister Mabel, or you. But that's the way our mind works. And Satan, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking who may devour. And Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. And last week we talked about that in the morning. To be able to recognize these things. Let me ask you. Does he have both? Are you already in his clutches? He had you in his grip? Now, to end it all up, hypocrites have but one destiny if they don't repent and change their lives. It's eternal damnation and the devil's hell. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he's not aware of. And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 24, 50 and 51. It's not just what we do. But what we do and why we're doing it. If we're going to avoid the condemnation of our Lord. We must learn not to be deceived. There's the problem. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and sight of men. For they in cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. Ephesians 4, 14 through 15. Let me make something clear. We should have love for the people we're preaching the truth to. We're taught to love them as God loves them and especially love our brethren. But there's more to that, preaching the truth in love. It means preaching the truth that you also love and you wouldn't water it down for anything. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We cannot compromise one iota of the truth that pertains to how man is saved and how man stays saved. So we should be well grounded in the truth. And that way we can recognize falsehoods and guess where it begins? In our own minds. But no actor is flawless. Eventually, their deeds show their true character. Paul said to Titus in Titus 1.16, They profess they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every good work reprobate. We must avoid encouraging deception. John wrote in 2 John verses 7 through 11, and remember, this is written to Christians. For many, not a few, but for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. It may seem inhospitable, but we can't let the false teacher, I don't care if he's a part of your family or the sweetest smelling and best sounding preacher that ever walked the earth, we can't let that false teacher or others think we approve of his or her teaching. Remember the hypocrite who does things solely because they are polite. One of the things I've taught in preacher school over the years to the young preachers, or those that were running for preacher, I guess that's one way to put it. One of the things I've taught is beware of the member. When you first meet that member, it seems like that your mother and daddy, and they've known you all their life, and they put their arm around you and just hug you up. Keep your distance. It's not normal. It is not normal for people who don't, who, who don't have any idea of one another, they just met somebody, to embrace you as if they've known you all your life. It's not normal. Watch the person who gradually meets you, and gradually gets to know you. That's the person that will probably be the one who's really determined. Nothing's perfect in your estimation. But there's some good guidelines. And all I have to do is just say, think of the politician running for office. When he meets you, how does he treat you? 
That ought to tell you something. Something. We must live honestly with ourselves and others. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Ephesians 4.25 Remember God's words. He that worketh this seat shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Psalm 101 verse 7. Can't get plainer than that. Are the hypocrites in the church? That is the silliest question. Where would you expect them to be? I, you know, sometimes we just can't even get up to Ned and the first reader. If a wicked person wishes to pretend to be righteous, he's going to be attending the services. He's going to be a part of the church. But would a truly righteous man not come to serve his God? In other words... You're not responsible for every single solitary secret thing known only to God. So I say, by the fruit you shall know them. In time, these things tend to out on people. But you do what you can as you see the need to do so. And as Paul said, lay hands suddenly on no man. Keep your distance. And you know if that person's in bad shape, whatever person's in bad shape, and you want to help him as God requires you to help a brother... Just because you kept your distance doesn't mean you can't perform your duty to that brother. If that brother turns into a situation to where they can't provide for themselves. Perhaps some are struggling with making their lives match the righteousness of God, but at least they're working at it. We're told to discern the difference between people and their growth and development. That's part of being mature in Christ. But whatever it is, see then that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Let each come and serve our Master with sincerity and honesty of heart, preaching the whole counsel of God and seeking to be obedient to all the counsel of God. If you're not a Christian today, we beg of you to believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. To truly obey Him in repenting of your sins, Acts 17.30. Confessing your faith in Him as the Son of God and then being baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or the forgiveness of sins. As a child of God, well, what's the lesson about? Maybe I should start there. Have you been a hypocrite? Well, remember this. It's only before men that you can act your part. God knows what you really are. So there may be a need to fully repent and turn from that actor's life and be honest before God. Serve Him with the whole heart and begin by repenting of that sin and confessing it to God and praying for forgiveness as God's second law of pardon for His children. If you're subject then to the blessed will of our Lord, we invite you to come to Him while we stand and sing.